And thank you for coming to our service this morning. I appreciate having somebody to talk to. <laughs> I know why you're here. Because we had a cliffhanger last week in the message. You remember that? Now, if you weren't here, it's okay. I can, I can help catch you up to speed with what's going on. But you know, you can catch yourself up to speed too. You can visit www.cslsr.org our website where you can review all of the videos, or if you prefer audio, you can do that, because we're going to be adding on new information to each week as we progress this month and next month. So here's what's going on. All of August and all of September, we're talking about spiritual mind treatment, which is... Um, if, if you're just visiting with us for the first time, spiritual mind treatment is one of our terms. It's a type of affirmative meditation that is quite similar to prayer, but with some differences that are quite significant. Uh, but, but before I talk about the cliffhanger in spiritual mind treatment, I'd like to put it into context a little bit so we can see how spiritual mind treatment is part of a bigger picture at our center. It's one of the five pillars upon which our movement's tradition stands. So these five pillars, they all point to um, divine mind, which is another term we use here. It's a synonym for God, thank heavens. Oh. <laughs> And, and we use the word mind, divine mind, so that we can also understand God as something that is non-physical, intelligent, everywhere present, the source of all things. That's why we use it. And these five pillars together are intended to draw us into our understanding and experience of divine mind. And so... Together, they make the foundation of science of mind, which is the teaching that we teach at the Center for Spiritual Living. Now, the first one, and in no particular order, the first one is selfless service, and sometimes we call that sacred service because when we show up to do whatever we do to help an organization or to help a friend, um, it's more than a task that we're doing. Um, we're, we're bringing our sense of holiness to that task. That's why sometimes we'll even use the Sanskrit word from the Hindu tradition, seva, when we're referring to this selfless, sacred service. Because seva means an act of devotion, a service to the holiness divine mind. That's what it really means. So you can see that when we think about volunteering here at the center, we're actually thinking of a spiritual practice that is an act of devotion. We're uh, thinking it, of it as an offering. We're thinking of it as um, a sacrifice. Well, isn't that a beautiful word, sacrifice? It means to, to make holy. It means to set something aside for holiness, not for ordinary business, for holiness. So that's what we, what we mean. When we show up to do our volunteering, we're, well, if you, if you will, we're acting as agents of the divine. Now, that should change the way you show up. <laughs> right? I mean, if you're, if you're an agent of the divine and you're showing up to do a task, surely you're going to be nice. Right? It's going to affect the way you show up if you think of it that way because now your motive for volunteering is even larger than the good motive of helping. Now you have built into it, I'm doing my thing. I'm practicing my faith. I am an agent of the divine. So I better behave appropriately. On Friday night, we uh, had a party here. We honored all the people who volunteer at the center. And I announced a free event, a gift for all the, the current volunteers at the center and also for all future volunteers at the center. I'm offering a 
free values-based volunteer workshop with me on September 22nd at 9 a.m. And it's free to anyone who has volunteered at the Center for Spiritual Living or anyone who would like to volunteer <laughs> at the Center for Spiritual Living or for anyone who would like to up-level their volunteering wherever they do it in the world, you can come and learn together because this workshop focuses on the values that changes volunteering from work, good work, into selfless, sacred, devotional practice. Oh, you got to love that. No, that's fabulous. Now, if, uh, this kind of volunteering, if you get into it, with this mindset, if you get into it, I think it's the antidote for low self-esteem. I think it's the solution for feeling disconnected from the world and for community because it shifts your focus away from self to other people and you become less concerned with um, what you'll get out of it. You become less concerned with being thanked for it or recognized for it. And you become more aware of what can happen when you show up as an agent for the divine and watch what the divine mind can do through you when you get yourself out of the way. Now, if you, if you, if you want to attend this free workshop, you have to visit Donna at the volunteer table right out as you leave to register uh, because I need to know who's coming so that I can prepare for you. Now, another one of the pillars of our five pillars is called circulation. Now, this is all about maintaining our connection to the infinite flow of possibility that life is for us. And the way we do that is through giving and receiving and asking and forgiving and giving thanks. And so our practice is to pay attention to these five activities to make sure that they are functioning, that they're not stalled, that they are not stuck and not moving because don't you know it's very hard to be in the divine flow if you're not giving thanks on a regular basis. Oh, it is very difficult to be in the divine flow. If you are a taker and never give anything, oh, it's challenging to, to receive. And you've got an issue around receiving. You know what I mean by that. Some people are great givers, but they can't receive easily. And for other people, it's the other way around. They're great receivers, but they don't give a thing. <laughs> and, and some people, you know, um, they receive awkwardly, and, and they also don't know how to advocate for their needs. They don't know how to ask. And, and there are some people that are uh, on it goes. In other words, everybody's got a place in these five areas where there's room for them to be a little more fluid a little more expansive, to allow a little bit more. So I'm offering a five-week class on the five Tuesdays of October at 10 a.m., and we will focus each week on one of these activities and how they relate to being in the dance of life. That's why the class is called Circulation, Joining the Dance. You know, not standing outside watching. How do you get into the dance? Good news is that you can take this class online or in class. Both options are available. And you can register in the social hall or online. Isn't that wonderful? And by the way, uh, we were out of the required reading for this class. It's, the book is called uh, the, the Prosperous Life Journal. And um, so we were, going, we were planning to hand out copies of the reading assignment that we made from the book. Good news is that it, the book is being reprinted, and it's going to be available like just days before the class. So you will have the option to receive the handout, or you can purchase one of the journals and have a hard copy, because there's something nice about journaling in a book. So that's available for you also. I love how things work themselves out at the last minute <laughs> when needed. Another one of the five pillars is called contemplation or meditation. Now, these are, this is the practice, all the various practices of reflecting, silent reflecting. 
that help us maintain our awareness of and conscious connection to divine mind and what it is and what it's saying to us. Th these are the, the moments where we sit quietly that help us stay in contact with our intuition and spiritual guidance that we need for making good decisions in our life. These are the practices that slow us way down so we can integrate, notice, understand, be. And there are all kinds of ways to contemplate. We have several free opportunities to practice meditation, like on Sunday mornings at 9.35 a.m., there's a meditation. On Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m., there's a meditation. On Sunday morn Saturday mornings, I beg your pardon, on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m., there's a meditation practice group, and it's followed up by a book study. It's wonderful, free. And then there is the monthly world peace meditation that takes place on the last day of every month except op October for obvious reasons because <laughs> people want to go trick and treat. <laughs> and then there are a number of seasonal uh, meditation opportunities that we always announce in our bulletin. So there is support for you for meditating and learning how to meditate. Another one of our pillars is spiritual study. Oh, I've got to talk to you about this one. Because don't you know at the Center for Spiritual Living, we do not have a conversion mission. Isn't that a relief? <laughs> we don't send you off to convert the masses or convert people into our way of being. No, we have an education mission. That's why all you ever hear us talk about is classes, 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 study, 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 study. So we're a culture of learning. Oh, we are students. We love reading. That's why it's always this book, that book, a book of the month, so many books, books, books. Oh, and we love asking questions. And we love thinking about what we are thinking about. We love that. <laughs> We're a culture of learning, so obviously we must have, and we do have, free weekly classes on spirituality on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. This next month is very interesting. We have a series on conscious parenting using science of mind principles. Oh, that's going to be so good. And don't you know that this class is appropriate for adults who have no children? Because don't you know, you can use the principles of conscious parenting with science of mind principles on yourself. <laughs> yeah, so don't disqualify yourself if you don't have children. Come to the free Wednesday evening class at what time? Seven. Yes, did I say it was free? Yeah. And so is the tea. We also offer certificated classes, and I don't know if you know this, but the certificated classes, you can start at the beginning and follow them all the way through until you can become licensed as a professional spiritual coach. It's called being a practitioner. I think everybody should do that for themselves. It's so rich. It's that rich. And I don't know if you know this, but you can actually take it even further than that. And you can enroll in our school of spiritual leadership and become a minister right here in Santa Rosa. And I don't know if you know this, but right here in our education ministry, we offer a nationally fully accredited master's in consciousness, a master's degree right here at our Ernest Holmes College. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do. We also offer um, spiritual enrichment courses, smaller courses, for people who may not be able to commit to a long s a class. So maybe they can take two or three or five week class at most. So we offer those. They're called spiritual enrichment courses. Uh, like, for example, Lawrence Edwards, who spoke a couple of weeks ago, he's offering a class, Living the Serenity Prayer. How do you bring science of mind, spirituality, and the serenity prayer together and then live it? Oh, it's going to be good. Or how about the one that Sayota Bell is teaching? It's called the Undiscovered Country. And what's good about that particular class is when you register, you get a free textbook. <laughs> and it's a class about the aspect of immortality, life, beyond life. Got to love that. Who doesn't want to talk about that? 
finally, there is one pillar left. I wonder what it might be. Spiritual mind treatment. So you can see in this context why we would spend all of August and all of September talking about it. It's part of what holds up the practice. These pillars together form a well-balanced spiritual life, and they ought to be in good shape and in good understanding for the wheel to work. And now this can let us get back to that cliffhanger. How did we end last week? Well, like this. There you are. You're following the instructions as best as you can to do your own spiritual mind treatment. You've sat down to let go of all tension as best as you can. You've cleared your mind with, uh, to the best of your ability of all tension and worry. and You've thought about divine mind. What is God to me? In words that have meaning, slowly, in an unhurried way, to, with enough time to really feel the thoughts. You've considered your relationship in it and to it. And then you've made some statements and some denials. Now, if you're going, what? What's he say? What's he say? Well, you've got to go back and watch the video from last week. I mean, you've got to understand what does it mean to be in denial in this context. You may be surprised. Then you've given thanks in your own mind, and you've released your prayer, and then it's done, and you're filled with a sense of calm and acceptance, and here's the cliffhanger. Then what do you do when your mind starts to sabotage your work? What do you do when your mind starts to obsessively think about the worst case scenario? What do you do when your mind wants to go back and dig up all these beautiful thoughts that you've sown like seeds? What do you do when your mind starts second guessing everything? What do you do when your mind seems to be filled up with fear and worry and doubt? Well, the answer to that is in this week's topic, simple acceptance. You simply accept it. That's exactly what you do. You simply accept that fear and worry and doubt exist and that they are not creative powers. They are ordinary human responses, and they are not to be feared. Now hear this. <laughs> Fear does not create. Love does. Worry does not create. Love does. Doubt does not create. Create, it is not an independent creative power. It does not create. Love does, contrary to what you may have heard about metaphysics. Look, you and I both know that any powerfully negative attitude of mind when obsessively indulged in over and over again is not going to be good for anyone. We know that. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of clinical conditions that need professional help. No, I'm not talking about persistent negativity. I'm not talking about persistent, ongoing, long-term sadness. I'm not talking about persistent, ongoing, endless worry. I mean, these are things that can and should be addressed with proper health. I'm talking about the garden variety of worry and fear and doubt that just pops up normally, you know, like when a loved one gets into trouble. Or like when you lose your house in a fire. Or like when you get a diagnosis that you weren't prepared to get. Or like when a, a relationship ends. Or like when a relationship begins, <laughs> you know. 
See, spiritual mind treatment does not require us to be superhumans with no feelings who never worry, <laughs> who never think a negative thought, who never doubt, who never fear, who never feel sad, who never question. No. Spiritual mind treatment can be done by a normal human being with normal human being feelings and experiences. And by now you know there's no such thing as normal and nothing normal about normal. <laughs> so when I say a normal human being, I mean you. <laughs> I mean you as you are with whatever is going on in your life. You, imperfect, worried, messy, nervous, neurotic. <laughs> you can still use spiritual mind treatment for powerful results. It's not about being perfect or acting as if nothing ever troubles you but I think you do have to be clear on what spiritual mind treatment is and what it is not. Now, two weeks ago, go look at the video. It's important. Two weeks ago, we started exploring what is spiritual mind treatment by comparing it to what it is not. So this week, I'm going to add to that, to what it is and isn't. So, spiritual mind treatment is not something that if you repeat it enough times, it will somehow get through to God. <laughs> oh, there's a time and place for repetition, you know, like chanting mantras. That's beautiful. Or repeating affirmations, you know, to sort of clarify your point. It's like spiritual vitamins. Yes, of course, there's a place for repetition. And spiritual mind treatment is a, something a little different. Spiritual mind treatment is a one-time, complete, standalone event that happens in the silence of your own mi mind or spoken out loud or written down, you know. One time. In other words, you know, you, you do a spiritual mind treatment today for peace of mind and you wake up tomorrow and you discover you, you're not as far along with the peace of mind as you were hoping. What do you do? You start fresh right where you are all over again and do another brand new one-time complete standalone event that happens in the silence of your own mind or spoken out loud or written down on paper. In other words... Each spiritual mind treatment is made fresh from the beginning. It's alive. Spiritual mind treatment is not something that has to be phrased just so in order to work. In other words, it's not a formula that needs particular words in order to work. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, it's much better than that. It's personal. It's intimate. It's unique. It's spontaneous. It's thoughtful. So the words you use must be your own words, and they must come from your own heart and your own mind. So they may be faltering. They may, may be, uh, wander around for a bit, they, but they've got to be unique. They've got to mean something to you. You have to understand them. It's got to be you. No point in repeating somebody else's words if A, you don't believe them, and B, you don't know what they mean. <laughs> then we would call it science of mindlessness. <laughs> No, spiritual mind treatment is not something that describes or lists the problem. Oh, you know, like God needs to be reminded what's wrong. <laughs> of course, there is a place for talking about your problems and your fears and your feelings and concerns. Oh, that's important to have such a place. I mean, for, for me, it's helpful to talk about that. That's why 
therapy is so valuable, or a life coach is so valuable, or a best friend is so valuable, or a prayer partner is so valuable, or a licensed practitioner. So that you can pay for a session and talk it all out. I mean, when I talk out what is worrying me, that's when I can breathe deeply and then leave it aside for a moment and turn to my spiritual mind. But if I try to stuff down what is worrying me, if I try to pretend it's not there, it just comes with me. Wherever, and it comes back out. So I talk about it to a trusted friend, for example, enough so that I can put it aside. That I try not to be one of those people that goes on and on and on about the same problem and never moves to spiritual mind treatment. I try. Because spiritual mind treatment is putting it on hold long enough so that I can be thinking about the higher spiritual truth about the situation that I'm dealing with. Now, out of context, that might be a lot to handle. So you've got to go back two weeks. What is he talking about? Because it can sound superficial. No, no. It's complicated. Deep. So to give a spiritual mind treatment using all the directions we're accumulating so far would mean something like I'm going to sit down. I'm going to get comfortable as I can. I'm going to give my body a chance to relax, let the tension go. I might even breathe deeply for a while. I'm going to release tension as best as I can. I'm going to decide for at least a few moments that I'm going to turn away from the situation in front of me so I can treat it. Now, there's a beautiful example in this lovely book, The Basic Ideas of Science of Mind. So if you're anything like me, you've got about six books that you're reading simultaneously, you know. And he says in this, uh, first of all, enter into the closet of your mind, the quiet, private place of your consciousness. Forget about your needs for a moment. Make yourself comfortable and know that you're, being, you're going to be working inside of divine mind. Spend a few moments thinking about the many blessings you already have in your life, just the simple things. Name a few of them to yourself and give thanks for them. Be truly grateful for them and say so. And then remain in perfect silence. And then speak your words softly, trustfully and happily and then he gives examples of the sort of things you might want to say you know like my mind is a center of creative activity within divine mind i draw upon the infinite creativity of divine mind i'm a channel for its expression in the world so i choose wisely i act wisely i think beautifully as an agent of the divine, I express love and connection. I'm guided from within. And you go on like that, you know. That's what he's suggesting you do in that sanctuary. And that phrase he uses, enter into the closet of your mind. Who knew you would come to church and be told to go back into the closet? <laughs> but it means something very specific. It means in the quietness of your own mind, he means be quiet and private in your work, in your spiritual mind treatment. Why? Because when you're doing spiritual mind treatment, often it's about something very tender and very personal. And when we are dealing with that and we feel vulnerable, we can be susceptible to other people's influence. So in the opening line of this week's signed reading from Living the Science of Mind, he says in it, don't be too talkative about your spiritual mind treatment work. It's personal. You, you may remember from last week, he says, it's your job to convince yourself about the spiritual truth. You don't want to be spending your time and energy convincing other people. You don't want to be spending your time managing other people's fears, concerns, and disappointments. You've got work to do. If you're going to share it, you might want to share it with people who are on the same page with you and can move in the same direction as you. Ernest Holmes says in this book, he says, we want to get to a place which he calls simple acceptance. 
And he describes that as the innocent acceptance that a child has when he or she asks a parent for a cup of water and expects to receive it. And then the last part in that reading, he talks about his gratitude. Oh, it's a very important part in spiritual mind treatment, gratitude. And it's so easy to confuse gratitude with good manners. You know, good manners is when you say please and thank you. And if you don't say please and thank you, somebody might rightfully think you've got no manners. But it's not the same thing as the gratitude we're talking about inside of a spiritual mind treatment. Look, gratitude, I mean, good manners, good manners are appropriate in social settings. A and what I'm about to say to you next may be difficult for you to take in. And it's risky for me to say it. I mean, I, I could upset you by saying it. Yet it is important enough for me to risk saying the difficult thing because of how important it is to understand how spiritual mind treatment works. And here it is. The divine mind, God, does not need or require the words thank you from you or for me. Thank you, as good manners, cannot change divine mind's mind. Good manners is not what makes a spiritual mind treatment work. And I'm going to tell you exactly what I mean by that next week. <laughs> uh-huh. Won't you breathe in with me and exhale, letting your eyes close as we each in our own way turn to thinking about what the divine is. The infinite, the everywhere present, the ground of all being, that which knows everything is the source of all knowledge. And we might spend a good long time thinking this way so that we lift ourselves up Call it the love of the ages or the peace that passes understanding or the creator, whatever we call it. And I, I identify myself with this everywhere present divine energy so I can remember that that's my home inside of divine mind. That's where I live. That's what everywhere present means to me. So I can feel more closely the idea of being an agent for its expression in the world. And I let that thought change me. I let me realize that with this thought in my consciousness, I'm an agent for divine love, that I show up differently and I'm embracing that. For me and for everyone, I am now attuning my eye to see the expression of divine mind everywhere I go and in everything I do. And I allow that to help me adjust those circumstances in the world where bringing love to play can result in a betterment in social conditions, in helping people who may, may not be able to help themselves, in expressing myself, in advocating for those who need my advocacy. So I let my contemplation on the divine open me up to be all that I can be and that is worth celebrating. And together we say, and so it is. Mm -hmm.